Yes, he's been shot right through the head. What's the name of your place? This is Chippendales. Oh, wow. Hey, everyone. My name is Joanne Choby, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of working with the best true crime team in the business at ID and Discovery Plus. And I want to welcome you to the first ever ID Conversations. Each session, we are going to take a deep dive into the true crime cases you are obsessed with. They're the ones that are ripped from the headlines or even the stories you may not know everything about, but you can't stop thinking about them and you want more. We're going to gather experts and those closest to the case to give their opinion on what really happened. We have an exceptional panel for you today. I promise your ears and your eyes, they won't be disappointed. We are all familiar with the exotic male dance show, The Chippendales. But what I don't think you are as familiar with are the crimes surrounding three of the original founding members of the business. This is the focus of a four-part Discovery Plus docuseries called Curse of the Chippendales, and it's available on the Discovery Plus app right now. Listen, we've all seen Magic Mike's moves. I have felt the thunder from down under, but the show, the show that started it all, it was Chippendales. It was a cultural phenomenon in the 80s and 90s, and it went global. Think about it. Amazing music, iconic fashion, a place where women could be free and sexually liberated. Those cuffs, those collars, those beautiful men. But what you don't know is a different story that happened behind the curtain. A story of jealousy, greed, and ultimately murder. The FBI says this is the most bizarre murder for hire story they have ever investigated. And that's saying a lot. Let's take a closer look. This is Curse of the Chippendales. In the 1980s, Chippendales was so popular. There are three magic words. I'm going to say, what do you want them to do? And they scream, take it off! Outside, we were a hugely successful multi million dollar business. But the bigger we got, the more the problems piled up. Nick felt he solely was behind the immense success of Chippendales. Steve didn't like all the attention that Nick was getting. Both wanted to be the chief. Steve told me that Nick had been shot and killed. I just started to scream. Flash bulbs are in your eyes, and they're asking, do you know who did it? The puzzle pieces are all there. You just got to put them together. Behind it all is one megalomaniac who's eliminating a competition through arson and murder for hire. And they said, we've been notified that there is a plot to assassinate you. Wait, wait what? I am so excited to dig into this conversation. Listen, don't worry if you haven't seen the special, we are gonna get you up to speed on all of the details. But if you have, you are no doubt gonna recognize our two panelists here today. Eric Gilbert is the creative director of Chip and Nails and former partner of Steve Banerjee. And Dan Peterson, he's one of the original Chip and Nails members and former host. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We have so much to get to, but I'm going to dive right in. Eric, my first question goes to you. What does the Chippendales organization mean to you? What does it represent? Well, Chippendales it represented, even when I started there, a, a revolutionary, cultural revolutionary company. It was getting national 
attention at the time for women lining up to see near naked men, which had never before been an idea in American culture. It's like we're always lining up as men to see near naked women for decades. And Hugh Hefner basically jammed that down the throat of the American culture to the point where Chippendales was blowback for all this resentment that women had of being shown near naked women on centerfolds. And finally they got their share, they got their time and it was great. And it was catching fire rapidly. It was just a wildfire of attention, of media focus. So when I started there, I knew this was a, a big deal. This was a cultural revolution in the making and still going on. So it was exciting. Okay, Dan, same question. What does Chippendales mean to you? And I want to add on and say, what is the biggest misconception people have about the Chippendales? For me, Chippendales, it, it carved the path for me, I think, for my life in a way. It's weird to say that because I was only there for three or four years, maybe. But it allowed me to go from a naive, quiet person to learning about women in general. For me, I learned women are different. I learned patience. I learned that everyone can look at the same object and see it differently. And it's weird to say you, you got all that from Chippendales, but when you talk to a million women over a certain period of time, you learn that. And to this day, I use that. But it was something really unique. I have to say, looking back again, it was a whirlwind in, in, per se. I traveled, I was lucky. I got to travel to every state. I did talk shows, I did promotions. I got to go to Europe, I got to do so many different things that I would have never been able to do. And at the time, you have to feel good as one of the guys because everybody looked at you as something. You weren't really anything. You were a guy that was placed right place, right time. And I think that it was unique. And looking back, it did change, you know, sort of history on how women can act compared to what men used to be able to do. You can't describe how it was unless you were there. You really can't, at least at the beginning. And I look at the beginning Chippendales different than the later Chippendales. I, I think the beginning was more pure. I think it was more one-on-one. -on -one. I think the women enjoyed it better. It's like going to a concert where you're in a you know a small room, someone's playing acoustic versus going to a concert where there's 30,000 people. It has changed. They were both necessary, but it was so unique when it started. And what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about the Chippendales, Dan? The biggest part I thought was most of these guys were business oriented. They were accountants finishing school at SC. They were business majors at uh, UCLA. There were four guys there that at the time had $100,000 portfolios, which now doesn't sound like much. But in 1981, 1982, I didn't really even know what stocks were. And I remember these guys talking about, you know, they hit 100,000. They were in there to make their dollar and get out. So they were at, they were one of the actors. I was one of those. But I think that's a big misconception. You know, these guys were, they did have great builds. They did look good, but they also had something upstairs. And, and that might have been the biggest misconception, maybe from guys. Women, I don't think cared. But from guys, I think that was a big misconception. Eric, I want to talk a little bit about the business. You were with Steve Energy um, day to day uh, on that side of things. How did he look at the business? How did he run it? You know, wh what were some observations you took away from how he operated Chippendales? Energy was totally hands on, even to the point where every Friday morning was a ritual of signing like that thick of checks of hundreds of thousands of dollars going out of tables. He said, he would probably say, probably say that I'm, I'm doing what my father would do, which is to sign every check. And he would look and review again, after he already okay paying somebody, you know, why we're paying this much again. And I, and oftentimes just tear up the check and say, no, I'm not paying this. And Banerjee loved having total control of the operation. I mean, Banerjee was a control freak and, and deservedly so. That's how he came up with Chippendales and built it from, just a strip show to something a bigger brand that meant something to women of, of, of sexuality and uh, male sexuality. So Banerjee did that through being a, a very thoughtful, very meticulous, methodical, controlling person, but he was very controlling. And the whole company exude, exuded that. I mean, if you had any job there of note, you went to Banerjee. Everybody went to Banerjee. Everyone had their own inroad to Banerjee. Because Banerjee controlled everyone's position 
in the company. And so you learned that early on and respected that. And nobody made fun of Banerjee to his face or questioned him or, I mean, he was the owner and, and uh, he, he acted like it and, and nobody did anything unless he said so. So Banerjee was a very meticulous man who also thought like a mathematician about the making of a male dancer, the making of a male model, whatever it took that would represent the Chippendale's image to women that he wanted to put his name on, Chippendale's name. He can, it was his name, his creation. Whatever he wanted to put his name on, he did a mathematical formulization in his head to figure out what that, that face, that body would look like. I mean, early on, he looked at, at Dan Peterson based on a very popular television personality at the time and said, that's the face I want as a Chippendale's flagship model. And there's other, there were other models too that were flagship models like Brad Davenport or, or Michael Rapp. You know, these are faces that weren't just in the club, but they were on all the products and merchandise Chippendale. They were the Chippendale's brand. You know, Dan at the time had the face of the Chippendale's brand. So did these other people like, like uh, I just mentioned. So Banerjee was very meticulous and he was very mathematical. His, his sister was a math professor back in, in New York. He came from a family of nothing but, he was constantly like Rain Man figuring out, you know, things in a business, They're, the cost, the, the gross, you know, profit, the net profit. He was constantly breaking people down in that fashion too, you know, like that guy has a nose, it's like this kind of nose and this kind of face and he has this kind of look and he has this kind of personality. And he, he hired smart men to be those faces, you know, they weren't just dummy guys like Dan was saying, they're all guys who had other ambitions. They were just using their looks at the time to get there. Yeah, it, it's funny just to add a little bit to that. He's right. I mean, when I met with Steve, this is again before Eric sort of got there. It was a little bit different because he was feeling out what was going on, but there was no doubt Steve thought this out. He used to sit down at dinner and bring magazine after magazine, Vogue, Cosmo, GQ. He'd rip out pages. He'd make notes on each guy. He would, I mean, he would ask questions. And in the club, when the show started, there was a lineup where they introduced the hosts and the waiters, not the dancers, but the hosts and the waiters, one at a time. And the announcer had a story for each guy. And the women would clap and scream and do whatever. And Steve would be in that corner watching the response watching who was responding. Now, Dan, I want to continue with you. So um, Chip and Nails is growing, right? It's getting more and more popular. As being a part of the original group, do you have any stories or instances where you're like, this is crazy, this is huge? I mean, you must have experienced something that's like just so over the top. And there were, there were a lot of over the top things, but one of them that was one of the first things that caught me off guard is we did promotions. So we would fly like a lot of times I flew to different States doing a Spencer's gifts or a little mom and pa store where they'd advertise those oh, chicken else is coming, blah, blah, blah. And I'd sign calendars. Well, one of the things that we did was a mall here in California. I can't remember which mall it was, but South coast mall. And we had a table out there and there were probably seven or eight of us at, in the calendar that went and um, it was security. I mean, we expected maybe 500, 1,000 people, maybe, which is huge. But we were right in the middle of the circle of mall where it was like three levels up. And they had a row of tables there. We each stood there and they had it really roped off, really nice. And the, you know, security would bring women in and there'd be a line and we'd high and sign and, you know, do everything as we go. And I remember looking as this crowd grew and grew and grew. And I'd look up and all around the, the upper floors, the rails were completely full of women looking down, yelling and screaming. And, you know, there's echoes in mall. And so I don't know if there were 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 women there at, at one point, but it was loud. And it got to the point where I saw three or four of the security guards come over and they basically came over to us and said, look, we're going to take you into this room at the moment. No idea why, but I, after we, so long story short, all of a sudden these ropes, those red ropes that they have around started getting knocked over. We could hear in the background clanks and ropes getting knocked over. And you'd look and this group of women would be coming closer and closer on the back side of us. So they opened up this area and they rushed us into this door that was about 30 feet away and locked the door as we hear pounding on the door. And as we turn around, it's a boiler room, right? It's just whatever. It's the boiler electric room for the, for the whole mall. And, and still at that point, we're at least for me, I'm sitting there going, 
well, that was sort of weird. That was a quick exit. Our pens were still on the table. The calendars were still on the table. And that's when the security guard's on its walkie-talkie talking out there. And that's at the moment I understood, oh, that was weird. That is like a concert where, you know, the walls just got pushed down and these women are pounding on the door. And they basically weren't prepared for it. No one was expecting that at all. So they brought us out the back. They said it's over. They brought us out the back door. We go out. We're in the parking lot walking maybe 30 feet from the door. And all of a sudden, I think it was Dennis turned around and said, dude, look. And we turned. And it looked like I don't know, a thousand women coming down this parking lot, running after us. They were still, you know, a couple hundred yards away at the time, but we're walking, laughing at this, and they're getting closer and closer, and we couldn't see an end to the women. It was just deep, 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 and we took off running, and, and it, was, it was one of the instances where you just, at the moment, you're smiling, you're laughing, you're sort of going, what's going on? We're here signing calendars. It's, it's that 15 minutes of rock star fame that people dream of. And we've had, we had it a few times, but that was one that was probably the first one. And then once it happens to you once, honestly, your head adjusts a lot quicker. But I remember getting into the car and we were driving off and we were driving off seeing these women still coming after us. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was just, it was unique at the time. Damn, that story is so intense. And every time you tell it, it's amazing. Um, Eric, I want to turn to you and uh, on a more serious note. So let's go back to Steve Banerjee. Um, did you ever see any red flags with him or any behavior that just didn't seem quite right from, you know, the normal every day? Yeah, he was uh, a very polite man. You know, it's funny because people would talk about him with F-bombs and uh, profanity and it's like in his day-to-day -day dealings as a businessman you know as as the the owner the operator he was always speaking in polite tones it was always thank you you know it was like like the, the like a kid from the warehouse could be standing at the door and he'd say come in and then he would say okay thank you and it, everything was thank you and polite and uh you know, very serious, but then very humble. He actually had a humble presence about him. He was never about, look at me, I'm wearing this new outfit. He was not like that kind of person at all. He's very, you know, very serious, very focused. And he conducted himself in a very controlled, polite way. However, when he would get pissed off and that would really, really happen when two things would happen. One, it would be an employee working for him that was totally off and just taking advantage of them, that would flip them out. Or it would be somebody taking claim for Chippendales. And there was only one person at the time doing that, and it was Nick DeNoia. And it was Nick DeNoia that I would see Banerjee turn into this completely different person and get extremely angry and flip out. And I would see that on multiple occasions. And early on, my office was next door to Banerjee's wife's office, Irene Banerjee, where she would sit there every morning counting the money from the night before. And Banerjee would have a, Denoy would fly in from New York to look at the show. You know, I mean, he had this like, uh, you know, I'm the director and the, he had this like pont pontificated presence in, in, around the club, you know, like I'm flying in to look at the show. You know, the show's not going to change much in the two weeks or that he's gone. But anyway, he comes in to review the show. And if he sees something he didn't like, like Banerjee, the owner could do what he wants. Like he replaced a dancer or, or change an act, change the, the alignment of an act. So if there was something that didn't suit Denoya right, he would flip out on Banerjee and call it his show. Like, what are you doing with my, messing with my show? And Banerjee is like, listen, you know, it's my show. The, the, so Sorry, I can't say friggin' because it's just not what he said. And so this guy is the most, it's this, this Denoya, we get blown out of the water with that, but that's the most bad you can say because after that, it was just pure stutter. And he was frustrated that he couldn't dress this guy down because this guy was tall, he was, he was, he was theatrical, he was aggressive, and he could put Banerjee verbally in, in his place. And so Banerjee would threaten the guy because it's all he had left. And this guy would go running over to, Denoya would go running over to Banerjee's wife and say, he just threatened me, you know, he's gonna kill me. And she'd say, oh, Nick, he doesn't wanna kill you. He's, he doesn't mean it. 
And I just registered that in the back of my head. I'm like, wow, they got a volatile relationship. And I would often hear him say, I want to kill that. Dan, I want to switch to you now. You were present during the infamous napkin deal. Now, some would say that is when the relationship between Nick DeNoia and Steve Banerjee changed and went in a different direction. So you were there. Tell us what really happened. Well, I, I got to say, you know, to stand where Eric is as well. Yeah, I was, it, Steve and I would go out to dinner all the time at ships. And I had met Nick, uh, I don't know, a few months, a handful of months prior to that. And right off the bat, Nick ran, rubbed me the wrong way. And this is not a beat up on Nick, you know, show, but Nick was exactly that. He was this, this is the, I'm a director. This is mine, flamboyant. He broke that, you know, barrier that you have where people get in within four or five inches of you, um, demeaning, he talked down to you. He kept trying to get me to do the show. He, he was just somebody, and very few people do this to me, but right off the bat, he was somebody that I did not feel comfortable with. So for me, I, I always saw Steve as being extremely humble. He was, he was nice to everybody. I think he was extremely thankful to be in the position he was in. Um, I very seldom saw him get mad. And when he did is exactly, he stuttered so bad that he, he couldn't, he, he, he just, he, he was so locked on two or three words that that's all he could say. <clears throat> and Nick, I could just tell those were the buttons that he pushed. If, if it would have been anybody else, but Nick, they both would have been here today. It, it was just, it was just the wrong match of people. I, just to say that at dinner, and Steve and I used to talk about everything. I really, when Nick was there, he, he came a couple of times. It wasn't something I liked because I, I wasn't really involved in that conversation. It was them deciding on what to do with the show. It was Nick basically saying uh, how he was going to change Chippendales. Steve brought Nick in basically because he had an Emmy Award. That was the only reason. There were a thousand choreographers out there. We worked with several. The first choreographer, Henry, I thought was wonderful. But Nick had that trophy on his wall. And Banerjee wanted to legitimize Chippendales. He wanted to bring it. I mean, that's all he talked about. He wanted to bring it to Disneyland. He wanted to bring it to Vogue and Cosmo and Elle and clothing lines and music. So this, and, and Steve loved movies. So he saw this as an avenue to get him on Broadway. And that was Nick's pitch. I'm going to get you off Broadway. That was his pitch. So when they were talking about the show, I, I think Steve signed a lot of things. So I'm sure he signed several papers with Nick along the way. But Steve always thought that that's not a legal thing. And Nick pulled the napkin out and signed. I own this show on the road in perpetuity, signed it, Steve grabbed it, signed it, and that was it. And, and I didn't pay that much attention to it because that was Steve. I mean, I, I could see Steve signing away things to everybody in a way because this guy's a choreographer, right? It's, he's not taking, and, and also after Nick left, Steve didn't know what perpetuity meant. He sort of laughed about it in a way because thinking about it and writing three sentences to me was sort of a joke. I know down the line from other guys that me, Steve made deals with them also. And I really don't think that Steve thought these were legitimate deals. Who would give away uh, such a company to a choreographer? I mean, and especially somebody that, didn't thrill him. I was in New York when Nick started the show. I was there for three months when they opened it. Nick rubbed everyone the wrong way. So, I mean, this isn't justifying what happened. I'm just saying that it was just, it was sad how it worked out because that was not Steve. Steve was, he really was a nice, uh, humble, appreciative person. I want to ask you both uh, the same question, but Eric, I'm going to start with you first. When you found out Nick DeNoia was murdered, what's the first thought that pops in your head? Banerjee. Banerjee did it. It's the first thing that popped. I mean, I heard him threaten DeNoia so many times. And the last time I heard him in 86, I was sitting in Steve's office. We were in the second office. There were three offices throughout the, the, the lifetime. And uh, the bigger office, when we had the calendar and everything was going really successful. And he was on the phone with Denoya, and again, it was all the f bomb dropping, and um, you know, I could. See, and I was the only one sitting there in that high back blue chair, <laughs> which those same chairs followed all three offices, because um, Steve was too cheap to 
buy, buy better furniture. But anyway, so I was sitting there in that high back blue chair and he was on the phone and he's like, you know, F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. And then he slammed the phone down and he looked up and his, those, those dark black eyes were like looking right through me. Like I wasn't even sitting there. And he just said, like, like he was in a trance, like I'm gonna kill that. And I'm like, inside my head, I'm doing this. Outside, I'm just flatline. But inside my head, I'm like, holy shit, you're now a party to someone saying you're a murderer. So pretend like you didn't hear that. Like, I just like, I didn't hear that. And uh, he just looked right through me like he didn't say it. And then snapped out of the trance and goes, yeah, what? And I'm like going on about business. And he goes, okay. And I was like, that was it. And that was like the last thing that stuck in my head when I heard that Denoya was shot in Manhattan. I'm like, energy and then after that it was like your instinct tells you the truth but then your head starts playing with you because you don't want to believe the truth and i spent months and years trying to talk myself like it wasn't him but i was also telling the fbi it was him because i felt like you know i don't know if this is the right thing to do to keep working for a guy that you think is a murderer i mean just tell you know tell somebody and I don't really think he did do the murder, you know, like, so my head was talking me out of it after he already did it. And I knew in my heart he did. It. So. How about you, Dan? What did you think when you heard about what happened to Nick Denoya? Well, I had already been away from Chippendales for, I don't know, a year or two years. So I was a little separated, but it's funny because once you're involved with Chippendales, you hear everything. Candace called me immediately after she was notified that he was shot. And um, she told me straight out that Banerjee did it. And I kept saying, no, 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 I, Steve wouldn't do that because the Steve I knew uh, definitely would get mad, but you'd almost have to laugh at him because of the way he got mad. I did not see that in him, but that changed after I left. What I thought was Nick had been doing a show in Florida. I had already been called by a couple of the guys, you know, months before that, but Nick was doing a show in Florida and he, of course, got in some fight with the owner about money or something, and he took the guys with multiple days to go. He just pulled them out of Florida and flew home and basically screwed the club. And this was a mob owned club. So to me, when Candace said that, I kept saying, Candace, you know, this is Nick's doing in a way because wasn't it true that he pulled out in the middle of the night? Wasn't it true you guys had two more shows there? These companies spend, you know, a lot of money. And you know, promoting a club, promoting a show, and you just don't do that. And, and I could picture the way Nick did it as well. That was just my original assessment of what had happened. But Candace was full bore. This is what happened. It was Steve. And, and Eric knows better, you know, than I do, because I wasn't there during those times when Steve changed. Later down the line, it made a little bit of sense that it was Steve. And it's funny because Again, years later, I found out Steve had gone to the mob to ask to, for them to hit Nick. He had gone different places and ended up with Roy or with Ray. And that was his downfall per se. And but a lot of people thought it was Steve. I did not until years later. Um, and then there were a lot of things that came that made sense. A lot of the puzzle pieces came, you know, in with Reed Scott, we were shot at. There were a lot of things that sort of came together at that time. But at the beginning, no, I, I, I did not think it was Steve. Eric, I want to go back to you. Um, so you mentioned the FBI a little bit earlier. How did you connect with them? Did you go to them? Did they go to you? Um, tell us about that sequence of events. Just report it to the FBI. I'm talking to myself. I'm like, just report what you know and let them figure it out, you know? So it was a way I left to get more money. I got came back and I got more money. And by then, Chip Nils was in a lower place in, in Santa Monica. And uh, this is after the calendar had caved in. So to make myself feel better about working for a guy that I first thought, I thought was a murderer, I said, I'm going to just tell the FBI what I know. And I called their tip line. And I dropped a dime. I went down to the, the, the McDonald's that was from the down the street from the club and uh, on Overland there on the corner. And I went to the pay phone and I called the FBI tip line and said, well, I don't want to tell you who I am. But and so I gave him an alias. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. It was Mike Monroe. I said, this is Mike Monroe. You know, they knew I was an alias. But anyway, I'm like, this is Mike Monroe, Mike Monroe, like two of the same letters in the name. 
So anyway, Mike Monroe, and uh, I work for a guy named Steve Banerjee, and I'm just letting you know, I think he did it. I'm telling you why, because I heard, would hear him in his office, like I'm only spelling it out, it's Eric Gilbert, but anyway, I'm, I'm just a kid. So I'm trying to, trying to save my life at the same time, I'm thinking. So I'm saying, I think this guy, Steve Banerjee, did it. And here's why, because I would hear him threaten to kill this guy all the time in the office. So that was it. I, I, I did my due diligence. I felt like I worked for him because I still was 100%, like he did it, 100% he didn't. And I went on working for him for several months. But then things started happening that were getting weird, like things like we never did. Before. Like we would always drive around, like maybe 20 hours a week, we're driving around in meetings, you know, what have you, this, that. And these drive arounds, our business uh, drives together, started getting weird. Like sometimes we would drive to Canyon Country, which is like 50 miles inland from the coast where we had our offices. And he would say to me, he would turn to me and go like, uh, I want you to drop me off here. I'm like, but you're driving. And I'm like, yeah, I want you to take my car and drive it back to the office. And he wouldn't explain it. And I'm like, but we're at the entrance to Magic Mountain, the theme park, and it was closed. I'm like, you want me to drop you off at Magic Mountain? I mean, what the hell's going on? He's like, I know it doesn't matter. Just leave me here. I got somebody meeting me and just take my Mercedes back to Santa Monica. So weird things like that started happening that I had uh, that's that scared me. So, you know, or like another time Banerjee would say, <laughs> we'd go out to his car in the parking lot and, uh, and normally he would drive. He liked to drive and, and he didn't smoke. He didn't want to smoke in his own car. He liked to smoke. He wouldn't smoke in his own car, but he liked to drive. It relaxed him. And, uh, he just turned to me and said, here, I'm like, what? He goes, just take my keys. And I'm like, but you're driving. He goes, no, I want you to start the car. And I said, and I'm thinking Godfather, you know, part two. And I'm going, I'm not going to start your car, Steve. I mean, what the hell? You think it's going to blow up? Is that why you want me to start your car? And he's like, no, no. And he's smoking a cigarette. You know, I'm like, Steve, you start your own car and so he said okay fine and he took the keys and I stepped really far back but these are the weird things that were really happening at the time that made me think I need to make another phone call to the FBI because maybe he really did do it so like another level of paranoia that yeah. he had and he's got weird he yeah. okay got final really question weird. final question for you both um if Steve were here today what do you think you would say to him uh Dan I'll start with you well, it depends on if he did it or not. Are we saying that he did murder Nick or are we saying that life was going on as it was? Well, he was definitely convicted of, okay. of the crimes. So I think you should put that in your mindset. Um, so if if he's here and he was around, he's already been convicted of the crimes. If Steve were around today, what would you say to him? Yeah, for me, that would be a, an, a different story or a different conversation. I mean, if, if honestly, if Steve had not done it, it would have been different. I, I think even with our separation, you know, 10, 15 years past, life goes on, you have kids, I would have reconnected with Steve. If if it was the way life is and he was in jail and didn't hang, hang himself and got out, that would have been a different deal I, I, for me anyway, because even at the beginning when I thought he didn't do it, I definitely convinced that he did do it. Um, that would be harder for me to talk to him in general, even though I was very close to him at the time, it'd be difficult. I mean, it, that's just when somebody murders somebody like that for whatever you know reason, uh, that was a shame for both of them, for the families. I, I know his son, Christian. I mean, it, it didn't just end their two lives. It ended, they, it was a trickle down, you know, everything. And I feel bad for the kids. I feel bad for everybody. I feel bad for Chip and in itself. I mean, it was something pretty amazing. They could have been huge, um, if not for those two butting heads. And, and part of the change to me was when I was friends with him, there were guys that did coke and stuff, nothing terrible, but he would tell me, don't do drugs, don't drink, don't do that, which I didn't do anyway. And later on, he got into it. And I, whether Nick caused it or whatever the, the reason, the paranoia, everything stems from that. So um, I think that Steve definitely made a change. I don't, it, it was a different type of greed. I don't think money was ever an issue with Steve. He had more money than he could do in 10 lifetimes, um, no matter what happened. But I just think that 
you know, you, you have to lie in the bed that you make. And unfortunately, you know, Steve did, he, he was given that golden goose and, and not a lot of us get that opportunity. And uh, for whatever, you know, whatever reasons with Nick, whatever, he just could not control it. And he went down the wrong road. How about you, Eric? Well, I would say to Banerjee, like, what the F were you doing, man? I mean, you, you had it all. You had it all. Like, you didn't have to murder the guy. Chippendales could have been huge, bigger than the Playboy Enterprise, bigger than Cosmo. This is what Banerjee, this is what he looked up to. Hugh Hefner, Playboy, Helen Gurley Brown, you know, Calvin Klein. You would have been bigger than Calvin, uh, Calvin Klein. You would have been bigger than Steven Spielberg, you know. You could have been huge, Steve. Don't, you know, cave in to these, you know, to your, your, your demons. It's like Banerjee totally became a victim of his own demons. You know, he was pathologically cheap, like in a weird way, like just uber cheap. And he was also like, like really seriously upset about this thing with Denoya taking claim for his company. And it, I, I understand it because to Banerjee, it was his wife. Chippendales was his wife. And, and it's like this man slept with his wife and cuckolded him and made him impotent and made him feel, you know, like less than a man. And I, could, I understand, Steve, but you didn't have to kill the guy. If you kill the guy, you're done. And, and that was the thing that Banerjee, he just had no way of, of self-therapy <laughs> other than doing lines of blow at, at the end, which I, you know, like Dan said, I, I was shocked when I started realizing Banerjee was into blow because he was totally this guy that was like, I'm above that, I'm above this, I'm above all these weaknesses that people have with porn and addiction and everything. Like he's always lecturing me. We go to a porn company, it's like, oh, it's an addiction. I don't even understand people that do this. But Banerjee seemed to be in control of his demons. And those demons took overtook him. And I'm like, Steve, you had it all. You could have had everything you wanted in terms of success and showing you were the guy behind Chippendales. You just had to deal with this little punk director without killing him. You didn't have to kill the guy. Thank you both for joining us today. Eric Gilbert, Dan Peterson, you were amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Now I'm talking to you. If you haven't done so already, stop everything you are doing and go to the Discovery Plus app and binge watch all four episodes of Curse of the Chippendales. You won't be disappointed. And if for some strange reason you don't have the Discovery Plus app, we've got a fix for you. Go to discoveryplus.com and you can activate a seven day free trial. Terms apply. But I know once you get on the app, you are going to see all the true crime content we have, and you're going to love it and be hooked. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Joanne Chopi, and we'll see you at the next ID Conversations.